and we praise you for your word. We ask you to speak to us tonight in Jesus' name about our future and the future you have for us. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Okay, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where we were studying last week. We were talking about the parousia, that is the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody who is looking forward to the Lord appearing, say amen. amen. Because there is a special crown, did you know, set aside for those who love the sign of his coming. Those who love the sign of his coming. These days in the ecclesiastical church, you're seeing less and less people talking about it. I don't know why. To me, the way the world is going, you want to talk about it now. It says, comfort one another with these words. Take a look. First Thessalonians chapter 4, starting with verse 16, says, For the Lord himself, whoo, somebody say amen. amen. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we who are alive. Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, you are alive. Those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Jesus himself talked about this event, describing it, not only in Luke 17, but also Matthew 24, where I'm going to read from. Matthew 24, starting with verse 40. It says there, Then there shall be two men in the field. One will be taken. Paralambano is the Greek word for it. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. Therefore be on alert, for you do not know which day your Lord will be coming. Two will be riding on a motorcycle. One will be taken. Actually, in our, our case, both will be taken. Amen. Amen. One road king and one triumph rocket three. Brrr, smashing into the side of the guardrail. But that's all right, because I'm going to be in a state then when I'm not going to give a rip about my motorcycle anymore. Amen. Let's talk about why. Let's talk about why. That's exactly what I want to talk about. What is going to happen in that moment? What are you going to experience? Is it just a big, huge, I don't know? Or are there hints, are there descriptions in Scripture that can kind of give us a window as to what we can expect will happen on that day? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to study a passage of Scripture and expand on it a little bit tonight in the minutes that we have together. And I believe that as we study this passage, we're going to get, catch a glimpse on what the Lord has planned for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 51. I believe this is applying to the same event that we've been talking about. It says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. I.e., the Holy Spirit speaking through the Apostle Paul saying, I'm going to tell you about something I know you don't understand yet. I'm going to tell you a mystery. I'm going to tell you something you don't know. I'm going to reveal something to you that nothing else prior to this has kind of alluded to. How many of you guys love a secret? Say amen. amen. Well, this is one that God is telling you now. Behold, I'll show you a mystery. We shall not sleep. We should not all sleep. That is, we will not all die. But we shall all be changed. Now, the word changed here is interesting. This is 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 51 and following. And it says, we will all be changed. Ah, uh, la so, changed. The word changed means exchanged. It's like you're going to be exchanged for something else. It's not that like you're losing something, but you're going to be exchanging something. I remember in the old days when I used to be on wrestling team, you know, after we were done with a scrimmage or after we were done with a tournament, we would exchange t-shirts. You know, I don't know if they do that anymore, but you know, I would have my Punahou t-shirt and the Guy would, you know, from St. Louis would have his t-shirt, we'd go, we'd shake hands, good match, you know, I would give him my beautiful buff and blue, you know, t-shirt that said Punahou, and, 
you know, buff letters, and he would give me that ratty, stinky, maroon-colored piece of junk that said St. Louis on it. And yeah, you know. But here's the thing. That was an exchange. Okay? And in my case, I was downgrading, and the other guy was upgrading. But how many of you know if the Lord Jesus Christ is going to exchange something with you, it's going to be an upgrade? How many believe it's going to be a heck of an upgrade? There are certain names that you can tell it's going to be an upgrade. I'm going to live in a house built by Tom Gentry. For most of you, that's going to be an upgrade. I'm going to drive a car built by Ferrari. For most of you, that's going to be an upgrade. Right? If I, you know, I'm, I'm going to wear something and I'm going, to, I'm going to buy a suit made by Armani. For most of you, that's an upgrade. It says here that you are going to be changed, exchanged for something else by Jesus. Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Messiah. Jesus Hamashiach. Jesus the Messiah. God incarnate. The Word made flesh is going to come, and on a certain day, he's showing you mystery now, Kaleo. You, your body is going to be exchanged for something else. In the twinkling of an eye, there's going to be an exchange. And what is there is going to be transformed into something else. It doesn't vanish, it doesn't terminate, it's exchanged. And how fast does this exchange happen? It says it happens in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, and I've gone around and around with purportedly brilliant theologians who will analyze this passage and say, aha, see what's been talking about there is not the rapture. What's being talked about there is the second coming because it says last trump. Well, that word trumpet, interestingly enough, do you mind if I give you a little bit of theology? This is a fascinating word, last trumpet, sal Pigs. Sal pigs. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, sort of like a P-I-G-K-S sound. And what it means is this. A war trumpet. That last trumpet that sounds before a war begins. Before Jesus goes on the attack. Before heaven opens up and its armies empty heaven and come and descend upon the earth. Before that happens, this trumpet goes off. So this isn't the last trumpet. This isn't the last time you're going to hear a trumpet. That's not what this word is. It's not final, last, you're never going to hear another trumpet in the whole known universe. This is a trumpet call that starts something, that starts a process. To me, that fits into what the Lord's trying to say. Can I hear an amen? Trumpet will sound the dead in Christ, the, the dead will be rise imperishable, we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. How many of you are sick and tired of being sick and tired? Say amen. amen. That's the lot of being human. This body degenerates. It gets older. It gets sick. It gets hurt. It gets injured. This is not the body. The body that you're in right now is not the body that God intended you to have. If you take a look at the way Adam was built and Eve was created, Adam and Chava in Genesis 1 and 2, they had human bodies too, but they were created to never die. They were created to self-repair. Do you know, even now, if you speak to a geneticist, he will tell you that the human body has an amazing propensity for self-repair. But there is some sort of defective gene that is introduced into the gene pool that prevents our human bodies from being able to repair themselves from what they're supposed to. Do you know that not even cancer is supposed to be able to affect us? Do you know that the way the human genome is originally designed to operate, you could introduce cancer cells directly into the body, and the body is supposed to be able to identify that as extraneous tissue and eliminate it on its own. That's the way we're designed to operate, but for some odd reason it's not happened. This is not the body that God originally intended. But I believe what this is saying is 
He wants to give it to you. The day is going to come when what you have is going to be exchanged in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Now, I want to know, because I believe that. I can see that in Scripture, and I can see that's why these words are are, are there. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Do you know what this is talking about, Kai Kai? This is saying, this is declaring that although people die... And to the world, it looks like a loss. It looks like a terrible thing. Satan wants to use it to terrify people. Satan wants to use it to scare you. Satan wants to give you anxiety and worry about this demon of death. What this scripture is saying is don't be afraid of it. If you understood what God has planned for those who physically die when they're saved, there is no sting. In fact, the Holy Spirit, through Paul in this passage, is actually taunting death itself. There is a spirit of death. Did you know that according to the Bible? There's a spirit of death. There's a spirit of hell. There's a spirit of the grave itself. There are are fantastically powerful principalities. And death is one of them. And here, the Holy Spirit is using the Apostle Paul to taunt death and say, where's your sting? What what is it that you have that I'm supposed to be afraid of? Because look at what my God, look at what God intends to do for all who believe in Jesus Christ. When you introduce yourself to them, it's supposed to be terrible, but in fact, it's going to be something glorious. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory through who? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ gives us victory in this area. And let's talk about that victory. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, I'll take you through this as simply as I can. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it identifies the three components of the triune man. What does triune mean? Three and one. Okay? And in this verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it talks about you having a, Dave, spirit, a soul, and a body. Don't ever let anybody tell you that the spirit and the soul are the same thing. They're not. There was some confusion about it in the Old Testament, but it's been clarified in the New. A lot of things got re- 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 uh, revealed by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But we, triune man, is spirit, soul, and body. Now, there are four states of existence. There's previous, ooh, it looks like chocolate, previous state of existence for triune man, and that was when all three were together. Now, we have the present state, where we are now. Let's take a look at the present state. Present state says, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, write that down in your notes. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of what? Soul and spirit. Soul and spirit. Say that with me. Soul and spirit. There's a division between soul and spirit. So our present state right now, as you are sitting there here in this room, is as a soul and a body. There's a dividing asunder between soul and and spirit. So our present state is soul and body. Now, there is something called the intermediate state. And that is if you die now before the Lord comes. If you die now before the Lord comes, if you die tonight, your body will remain where? here on earth, but you will go to heaven. Your soul will go to heaven. Carried by what? 
Ah, that's right. It's a good question. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Write that down. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, We are of good courage. I say, prefer rather to be absent from the body and be at home with the Lord. Absent from the body, at home with the Lord. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells a story about Lazarus and a rich man where Lazarus and the rich man and Abraham are all in bodies, but obviously their physical body is on earth, so what body are they in? Remember, there's a dividing asunder between spirit and soul in the present state, in the intermediate state, your body is on earth, and now you are in a spirit body. Does it talk about a spirit body? Does the Bible ever say something about a spirit body? Well, you bet. And we're going to study that in depth. Not all of it tonight, but we're going to look at some of it. The Greek words for these are pneumatikos, psuchikos, and somatikos. Pneumatikos, psuchikos, somatikos. Spirit, form. Soul, form. Body, form form. Each one of these has a form. So, previous, all three together. Adam falls, Eve falls in the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> we have our present state, soul and body, spirit and soul dividing asunder. If you die tonight, your body stays on earth, but absent from the body is present with the Lord in your spirit body, in your soul. But, What eventually does God want to do? Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where we're going to stay for the rest of the night. It's talking about your physical body, okay? And it says here in 1 Corinthians 15, 42, 43, and 44, let's take a look at it. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Aha, which is exactly what we were talking about. It is sown a perishable body. It's raised an imperishable body. It's so, sown in dishonor. Raised in what? Glory. It is sown in weakness. Raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So now there is a glorified form, which gets us back to Glorified states, which gets us back to where we started in the first place. Spirit, soul, and body all together. So, to recap, Adam and Eve were created. In the garden, spirit, soul, and body all together. They fall. There's a dividing asunder between soul and spirit. So now they are soul within a physical body, spirit set apart. How can you tell? Can you see in the spirit? Can you hear in the spirit? Can you see angels? Can you see demons? Can you hear them flying around? If you can, you need me to come to your house and cleanse it. Because believe me, that stuff does happen, especially here in Hawaii, but I was just talking to my hairdresser about it. It's like easy stuff. She's all freaked about, no, there's like night walkers and men who's like, shut up. The name of Jesus takes care of all that. I can't, I can't count how many crazy houses we were in where the walls bleed and there's cold spots and people walk at night, you know, pastor, yeah, yeah, whatever. You anoint the walls with oil in the name of Jesus. I take authority over every single stupid Hawaiian spirit that's in here. I break your hold in the name of Jesus. I call the blood of Jesus down upon this entire house. In Jesus' name, every single one of you will be evicted this moment. Boom! Holiness comes. Holy Spirit comes, angels come. There's nothing a demon can do. I don't, give a, I don't give a what kind of name it has. Out it goes. Luke chapter 10, verse 18, 19 says, I have been given authority over all the authority of the enemy. There's nothing he's got that he can fix me because I stand in the name of Jesus. How about you? Somebody say amen to that? Okay, but nonetheless. Dividing the center of soul and spirit, I die tonight. I go into the intermediate state, spirit and soul, and then eventually when Jesus comes back, the glorified will be resurrected. The glorified form, is that going to be like it was for Adam and Eve? I actually don't think so. 
I actually think as a result of all this, we get an upgrade. I don't think what God originally intended for Adam and Chava in the Garden of Eden is what he has laid out for us anymore. I want you to take a look at verse 38. Do you mind taking a, taking a minute and, 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 and studying this with me? All right, take a look at this. Start with verse 38. But God gives a body just as he wishes. So whose idea is this new kind of body that you're going to get? Whose idea? God gives a body he wants. And to each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same. Well, duh. But think about it. It's saying here, there's one kind of flesh of men, beasts, birds, fish. Heavenly bodies, earthly bodies, glory of heaven is one, glory of earth is another. One's the glory of the sun, one's the glory of the moon, the glory of the stars, of different stars. Verse 44, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown perishable, but it's raised imperishable. That's what we've been talking about. So what is this saying is this. Your body, if it dies, will be resurrected. Will be resurrected. Look at your neighbor and tell them, you will be resurrected. You will be in a different kind of body. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. We read through this before. Sown in natural, raised in spiritual. What is the spiritual body? What is the glorified body going to be like? Okay, in John chapter 20, this is after Jesus has died and risen, risen again. There's an apostle named Thomas. Now, Jesus appears to all the other apostles, okay? But Thomas is not with him. So, when Thomas comes back, all the apostles excitedly tell him, Tom, brah, you can't believe this. Jesus, just like Mary Magdalene said, he's alive. Now, Thomas, for whatever reason, maybe he wasn't held as, as much as he should have been when he was a baby, you know, maybe, maybe uh, he didn't have a dog when he wanted one. I don't know. But for whatever reason, he has trust issues. And so this is what he says. I mean, for me, I, I'm a little bit, I don't really relate. He's seen the man walk on water. He's seen the man do a million other things. But he promised he was going to rise from the dead. And now you've got 11 of your cohorts, all including Peter, who is a very hard sell, saying, yeah, 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 we saw him, we saw him. And he's like, unless I stick my hand in his hand and feel the hole there and ram my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe. It, it, and yet, idiot, right? And yet, how many of us continually ask God for a sign? Show me this, show me that. I'll believe if, 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 Lord, I'll give you my life if, if you do this. If you come through with this one thing, Lord, then I'll be yours forever. I'll repent. I won't look at that stuff anymore. I won't go to that girl's house anymore. I won't do this on the computer anymore. I won't lie to my mother anymore. I won't, da, 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 da. there's a whole bunch of stuff you won't anymore. If God will just do this. Thomas, like him, you want to like stick your hand through the wound and you want to feel the side and only then but I diverge take a look John chapter 20 verse 25 it says the other disciples were saying to him we've seen the Lord but he said unless I see his hands and the imprint of the nails and put my finger in the place of the nails and put my hand inside I will not believe and after eight days again his disciples were inside this time was Thomas was with them and Jesus came the door is being shut the windows being locked and suddenly he appeared in their midst and said, peace be with you. Now, me personally, this is before Star Trek. So, it must have been somewhat alarming. Especially considering they were afraid of Roman soldiers coming and arresting them. And they're all freaked out anyway, right? They all look like Peanut. <laughs> suddenly they're standing there and probably from behind him, peace be with you, you know Startling. But he invites Thomas, reach your finger in here, see my hands, reach your hands, put it in your side. Spirit does not have flesh and blood like I do. So we're not talking about a 
spirit, soul anymore, but now we're talking about the complete package. And what I want to study is this. Jesus has this ability to move through walls. Jesus now has the ability to teleport, basically. Distance doesn't mean anything to him. Remember last week we were talking about Philip and the eunuch? We're talking about Jesus and the boat. We're talking about a bunch of different things where he traverses distances because distance doesn't seem to make any difference anymore. He just goes. Walls don't make any difference anymore. He just goes. Locked windows don't, don't matter anymore. He just goes. Heaven and earth, he moves between them. This is going to be you. Your state one day, Noah, is going to be such that physical reality, everything you see here right now, okay, that's like a solid chair or a solid wall, will be like smoke to you. Because here's my theory for what it's worth. I think the spirit world is more real than the physical world. Everybody thinks that the physical world, that which we see around us now, is actually more solid, and the spirit world is more vacuous or nebulous. I don't think so. I think it's the opposite. I honestly do. I think just like a wall made out of smoke, I could just walk through because I'm more real than it is. I think the spirit is more real than the, what we perceive as physical. I really do. And I think that's why when the spirit world and the physical world meet, it's always the physical world that caves in, not the other way around. Okay? <clears throat> so he's able, to he's able to move through walls. He's able to move between heaven and earth. In Acts chapter 1, we see he defies gravity. So gravity doesn't matter, matter to him anymore. Ever wanted to float? Ever wanted to fly? Do you know one of the most curious things about man is from the earliest dawn, he has all visions that he is supposed to be able to fly. He is supposed to have dominion over everything in nature. You are supposed to be supreme, and you're supposed to rule nature. Not just in terms of authority, but actual dominion. Do you know what, do you know what that means? That means that you were designed originally to be able to outfight a lion. You were originally designed by God to be able to outrun a cheetah. You were originally designed to be able to fly higher than an eagle. You were originally designed to be able to out-wrestle a gorilla, silverback, razorback gorilla. There is no animal that you are not supposed to be superior to. And beyond that, your mind possessing that divine characteristic that is somewhat like God's. This is the body, this is the form that he is promising you you're going to have. This is what Jesus had. He obviously has power over nature. He can speak the storms and just have them stop. You're going to have that as well. He obviously has power over animals. He has power over fish. Throw your nets over. There's no fish today. Oh, yeah, there are. Because I can call them. You will have authority and power over all the animals. Besides having dominion over them, you also have authority over them. It's two separate things. I'll preach about that one day. This excites me. He can eat and drink. In John chapter 21, they are out fishing, and Jesus is on the shore, and he makes them breakfast. He barbecues fish. Yes, big green eggs were in heaven, <laughs> or in the Bible. Okay, he barbecues fish, eggs, you know, wakey, wakey, fish and bakey. It's all there. And he says in Luke chapter 18, 22, if this offends you, tough. I'm going to drink wine again, but with you guys in heaven. Jesus is actually looking forward to drinking wine again. It's just, he's, he says he's going to wait to celebrate with his, until his disciples are all there in heaven with him. We're going to eat and drink. We're going to have a party. We're going to enjoy life. Life is going to be awesome. And this is all part of the glorified form that you are going to inherit. Now, how is that done? I've just described for you what is going to happen. How does it happen? Does the Bible actually tell us how this is going to take place? It does in detail. And we're going to talk about that next week.
God reveals in his word how he does that. I'm going to show you specifically what God's going to do with you when he comes again next week. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we give you praise and thanks. You are so awesome. I want you to take a moment right now to meditate on the new person you're going to be, the body that you're going to have that will never die, never get sick, be able to self-repair, have dominion, have strength, have authority. And I want to ask you this question in the privacy of your own mind and heart right now. Is it any wonder you are going through what you are? He needs to trust you one day with this much power and this much authority. You're going to have to use it to help others and serve him and glorify him. No wonder he is having you experience what you're going through now. You will need this humility in your heart. You will need this maturity in your mind. You will need this wisdom that you are gaining as you live this life that is relatively hard because one day he's going to put you in a position where you're going to use your abilities and you're going to use your God-given authority and God-given dominion to help others and serve him by glorifying his name. He has a future for you that he can't even share with you right now because you wouldn't be able to comprehend it. That's what the Bible says. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has for those who love him. He has a future for you that he can't even share with you right now because you wouldn't get it. But he has it. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let me say it again. Thank you, Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, bless us as we go out to live for you. We give you praise and thanks for your word. In your name we pray. Everybody shout it, amen. 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 All right, thanks for coming, guys. Give the Lord a hand because he's awesome.